Good morning. And happy holidays. Oh, the spotlight. <laughs> I'd forgotten about that thing. Now I have to readjust my eyes. <laughs> I think I've spoken once before about a calendar of affirmations that I received last year uh, as a gift and one of the interesting things about that calendar for me is opening it up every day and finding an affirmation that seems to be have been written specifically for me on that specific day. I get carried away uh, metaphorically with shopping during the Christmas holiday season. Actually, I get carried away with shopping all the time, but that's, that's a topic for another day. So anyway, I, I got up this morning and the affirmation staring me in the face reads like this. It says, today I remind myself that I am a powerful individual. I am in charge of my finances, my health, and my future. For years, I have believed there are moments of truth, moments wherein we know that despite all the appearances of everything that is going on around us, that the universe is still working smoothly and everything is going just as it should. So I, I believe that these moments uh, exist because I've had so many of them when I just know, despite everything that's taking place, that everything is as it should be, even when I don't like what's going on. So this week, I had a chance to read some Nietzsche. And so I came upon this topic idea, which is mountains of truth. So as human beings living what I believe is a spiritual existence, fortunately and unfortunately, we all kind of see the world in a different way because we see the world differently and we perceive activities and events differently. And as a result of that, there can be no single unifying objective truth that works for us all. So that's one of the reasons we have all of these different religions in the world, and it's also one of the reasons we have so many different philosophical ideas about life, and it's also the reason why we have so many different denominations. All of them have their ways of expressing what they perceive of as true. So there's no single unifying objective of truth. In America, we call ourselves Christians. In other countries, there are different names for the collective. But all of it falls under one creative law. We know that we didn't come into existence accidentally. So with these personal preferences, there are always some partiality to outside influences. Every one of us is influenced by something outside of ourselves. We are influenced by our teachers, we are influenced by our children, we are in influenced by professors we may have had, we are influenced by preachers, we are influenced by our friends, we are influenced by our spouses, and on and on and on. So that makes living this spiritual existence interesting. But it can also be inspiring and it can also be exciting. When we begin to experience the vitality of certain truths that we know in our hearts are true, we may not know how, but we just know. We feel it, we know it, and it just... It, it, it makes us feel like we're alive. 
When we have those kind of moments, those moments when we know what we need to know, when we need to know it, as Karen Taylor Good would say, those are special spiritual moments that increase the vitality of, the, of our lives. Those are moments when everything seems perfectly clear. So every one of us in this room has had those kinds of moments. Those are moments when you know that you're fully alive. You're feeling good, you're feeling healthy, and everything is working well. So why is it that we have those moments when everything seems to be going out of control? I'm going to tell you a Zen Buddhist parable. So there's a man, and he's traveling across a field. And he encounters a tiger. And he ran away with the tiger chasing after him. He came to a cliff, and then he had nowhere else to run. And there just happened to be a root of a vine that was coming up out of the ground. And he grabbed a hold of the root of the vine. And then he swung himself out over the edge of the cliff. And he's hanging there. And so the tiger comes up to the cliff. And he's snarling at him from above. And trembling... The man looks down and he's trying to determine how far he has to fall. And when he looked down, he realizes that there's a tiger waiting below. <laughs> and so only the vine sustained him. And he's hanging there. And then out of the corner of his eye, he sees two rats who have started to gnaw away at the vine that is sustaining him. So there he is, a tiger above him, a tiger below him. The only thing he has to hold on to in life is the vine and there's two rats who are gnawing away at that. And then he glances to his left and he sees a strawberry bush. And it's filled with lush strawberries. And with one hand he lets go and he grabs a strawberry and he eats it. And he thought, how sweet it is. So that's the end of the Zen story. So the interesting thing about Zen stories is you get to create your own future with them. And you get to create, create your own outcome. But the profound thing about Zen stories is the realization of how sweet it is. How sweet it is. And sometimes for us to really get to that point of understanding how sweet life actually is, we have to have these kinds of challenges. Something wanting to eat us from above and something wanting to eat us from below before we are really ready to acknowledge that life is all right. And so in my end of the Zen story, he eats the strawberry, the tigers get tired of waiting. They go home, he climbs back up on the cliff and goes on about his life. Because we get to create our own stories. And sometimes life feels to us like we are walking through hell. Things get difficult for us, challenges arise, and we wonder whether or not we'll be able to make it through them. But if we keep our minds and our spirits focused on the reality that life is sweet 
and that we are willing to deal with whatever we have to deal with in order to experience that sweetness, things begin to turn around and things change. Tomorrow is always a new day. Debbie Ford said to live in the light of a new day in an unimaginable and unpredictable future, you must first become fully present to a deeper truth. Not a truth from your head, but a truth from your heart. And it's not a truth from your ego, but it's a truth from the highest source, that which we call God. Not a truth that's been suggested to you by someone else, but it's a truth that you feel in your soul, in your heart. And when you feel it in your soul, you can quiet that negative voice in your head that constantly clamors for your attention. That's a powerful idea. Every moment, every moment that we can accept what is, whatever that what is is, we can live our lives fully and healthily and hopefully. And we can do it without trying to judge it or deny it or defend it or explain it or to get angry about it. We just live it. Every moment we can just accept it provides us with the power that we need to feel what the scriptures call holiness. Holiness. Modern day therapists would call that just being whole. Being whole in yourself. How good are you at accepting your life. How good are you at accepting yourself? How good are you at accepting the world around you? Your friends, your family, your associates? Because that's a measure. It really is a measure of how much we think of ourselves. If I think everybody around me is a rascal, then I'm a rascal, probably. It's an amazing thing. It's actually an amazing thing. Problem with life is that to be successful in living, we have to work at it. We literally have to work at it. There's a great story I heard about Picasso. He was sitting painting one day and a fellow walked up to him and it asked him if there was such a thing as divine inspiration. And Picasso responded by saying, yeah, but when God comes down, he'd better find you at work. You better be doing something. So sometimes we sit and we wait for divine inspiration, but we're not listening to that inner voice within us and doing what is ours to do in the world today. Our work is to take care of the small details of life. I believe one of the major points that Nietzsche was making is that we should never define ourselves by the mistakes we make in life we should never define ourselves by the failures we make in life because we all make mistakes and we all have failures at every level. So the key to this particular point is for us to come to a point of acceptance and then to start looking at ways to make our lives better and to make the world a better place around us not repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again. In the 70s, I was a union steward for a major paint manufacturer in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and I 
as a union steward, had a little influence in hiring decisions and naturally in firing decisions. So I had an idea that we weren't reaching out to all the different people in our community and giving them an opportunity for jobs. I carried it to the president of the company. He agreed that he would hire a young man from a particular community that I was aware of and working in. So I went to the young man, I talked to him about it, asked him if he was really interested in taking the job. Now the short story is, it's a pretty easy job. Really it didn't pay a whole lot of money, but it was easy. You just had to show up and you had to do what was yours to do. There was nobody standing over you, making you do anything. They gave you the formulas to do your particular job. You just had to do it to the best of your ability. So this young man decided, yeah, he wanted to take it, so he came to work. He worked about three months, and then he started developing a pattern. Every Monday, he called in sick. Pattern went on for about six weeks. President of the company called me in. He said, Jimmy, does this young man want to work? I said, well, he said he did. He says, well, in the course of six weeks, he's had a grandfather die three times. <laughs> so something's got to be done. So I went to him, called him into my little work corner, and we talked it over. And he said he's going to do better. Okay, I said, let's give him another chance. Worked about two months, pretty steady. And all of a sudden, not showing, not showing up. The boss came to me and said, Jimmy, this is all last chance. This time, his grandmother has died three times. I said, well, you know, I hate to admit that I'm wrong, but perhaps I was wrong. I said, so whatever you need to do, it's in your hands. So the point is, there are opportunities all around us. And sometimes we make the best of them, sometimes we don't. And, uh, of course, the young man ended up losing his job. I don't know if he ever found another job to replace that particular job. But what I do know is that we had numerous people who would come into the company and do the same thing. And work is a part of life. It's a part of being responsible. It's a part of understanding how the universe works. It's a collective unity that we are that creates the world that we're living in. And we all have responsibilities to do our best to make the world a better place, whether it's a simple job like working in a paint factory, or whether it's running a corporation, or whether it's a military unit, whatever it is, we have responsibilities to make that the best that we possibly can. And it's never perfect. But when we do our best and when we are at our best, things work out. And they always work for good. Get sick, people die. It's all a part of the universal plan. But we all get a chance to participate in it. So on the mountains of truth, here's this incredible statement by Nietzsche. He says, on the mountains of truth you can never climb in vain. Either you will reach a point higher up today or you will be training your powers so you will be able to climb even higher tomorrow. And tomorrow, if you keep on the mountains of, of truth, those mountains of truth will carry you to a great place. 
There's that famous statement by Jesus Christ, and he said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But that's just the starting point. That's just the starting point. It's what happens after you know the truth that defines what your freedom looks like. And that's always a moving target. And if I could sing, I'd do a rendition of Climb Every Mountain, but since I can't sing, <laughs> that's all I've got. <laughs> Thank you. Let's take a moment to turn inwardly. Just breathe and relax. Let go. In the spiritual world, there's this thing called silence. And silence is almost indefinable because it's what takes place in between our racing thoughts, in between our words, in between our minds racing to and fro. And one of the most difficult challenges we face as human beings is quieting down all of the internal noise just being still. And in the stillness and the silence of our own being, just giving ourselves permission for the mountains of truth to enlighten us and to guide us and to direct us and to empower us and to strengthen us and to calm us and to heal us. So I invite you now to take a deep breath and just hold on to it for 10, 20, or 30 seconds, however you can without being uncomfortable. And then just exhale. Relax and release and let go of any tightness or any tension in your body. And every time your mind begins to race, just think to yourself, be still. The scriptures say, be still and to know that I am God. God, there is love, there is healing, there is power, there is an enlightenment, there is wisdom.
and there is joy. So one more deep breath. And then just be quiet and still. This message has been brought to you by Unity Church of San Antonio to open your heart, transform your life, and celebrate your divine identity. Visit us on the web at www.unityofsa.org. And remember, you are the light of God, so shine brightly today.